You can support almost any heresy, almost any heresy. As far as that goes, you can support almost any theology. You can support Calvinism, you can support Arminianism, and you can support any heresy if you will simply avoid one rule, and that is the law of context. Howard Hendricks says, in fact, every major cult is built on a violation of this principle, the principle of context. And so when you look at the scripture, when you study the Bible in order to teach the Bible, uh, what we want to always do is look at the context. We want to look at the immediate context, the verses a few verses before, a few verses after uh, the book, and, and so on. We want to look at the context of the kind of the midterm, the book, the uh, this this book as a whole, and then we want to look at the context of the Bible as a whole in light of what the Bible as a whole teaches. What does this passage teach? Uh, many Old Testament passages, as we look at, we need to look at and, and ask, what is our interpretation of this passage in light of? living in a post-Cornelius world. You remember that word, that story of Cornelius where uh, Peter is uh, given this vision and all these forbidden foods uh, come down like crabs and clams and, and so on. And uh, the angel comes to him and says, eat whatever you want. And he says, no, Lord. And as we and and so we're given permission in, in that passage to eat cra uh, crabs and so on if you, if you want to, and so we, and when we look at the Old Testament passage, we have to say what does this teach in light of what what it means to live in a post Cornelius world. The greatest example I've ever seen of violating this principle was uh, in the temperance society's uh, uh, motto. And the motto, if you look up in the upper le uh, left-hand uh, uh, side of the slide, it says, touch not, and the upper right-hand says, taste not, and uh, on the bottom it says, handle not. In fact, they had a song that went, went, touch not, taste not, nor yet handle anything evil breeds. Sipping drink, however little, is a dangerous pathway leads. Boys and girls, can all be merry. Happy as the day is long. Rosy cheeks like ruby cherry. Drinking water makes us strong. And it's based on the interpretation of this passage where he says, touch not, handle not, taste not. Well, let's look at what the, what the uh, scripture says in passage. And just by the way, I'm not a big fan of drinking. I never drink and I think it's a good idea not to drink. But the point is, what does this passage teach about this? Colossians 2, 20 and 21, since you died with Christ to the elementary forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Why do you submit to the rules? And the idea is you shouldn't submit to rules. You shouldn't live on a rule-based uh, 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 standard. Do not not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Why do you live according to those rules? Zwingli says, pulling a passage from its context is like breaking off a flower from its roots. Pulling a passage from its contact is like breaking a flower from its roots. Uh, I read the example on, uh, online where you take a simple English phrase like, it was a ball. What does that mean? It was a ball. If I said to you, it was a ball. Well, if I'm an umpire saying it was a ball, it means it wasn't a strike. It was a ball. It wasn't in the strike zone. It was out of the strike zone. It was a, a, a ball. If I talk to you about going to a dance, there's all kinds of dances you could go to. And I might say the dance was a ball. It was a particular kind of dance. Maybe we we're out golfing and I'm out in the rough because I hit my ball out there and I can't find it. And there's a white rock out there and uh, it, it looks like my ball. And I go over to it. And sure enough, I say, it was a ball. Hey, that was my ball. It wasn't a little white rock. It was my ball out there. Or maybe I took a trip somewhere and you asked me how the trip go. And I say, it was a ball. So according to context, according to the context, it was a ball could mean it's not a strike, but it's a ball. It's a particular kind of dance. It is really a ball, not a rock, or it was fun times. And it can mean all kinds of different things according to its context. And just by the way, we're going to get into the meaning of words in another video. And sometimes we will say, well, this word over here, it's translated this way, and thus it must mean that in this context. That's not always true. The context will determine the meaning, and many words have a kind of uh, linguistic range, and we can, we got to pick from that ling linguistic range based on the context. John Piper forever changed my life in many of his readings, especially the, the book uh, Desiring God, writings, excuse me, and I read a little uh, section from that book, uh, and his his overall theme is, 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 by the way, that we ought to pursue joy in God, what he calls Christian hedonism, that we ought to pursue, we ought to be obedient to the command of God to rejoice in the Lord always. I have often said that one of the most difficult and most important commands in all Scripture 
scripture is to re- delight ourselves in the Lord, is to rejoice our, uh, in the Lord always. And so he hears an objection to this idea and says, wait, 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 he puts in the, eye, in the, in the mouth of his objector. That sounds totally contradictory to what I've heard uh, as a call to self-denial. Don't you believe in self-denial? Isn't that the essence of Christianity? Didn't Jesus say, he who would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross? Isn't that what Jesus said? There's a, that's a place of death and suffering and crucifixion and follow me. Don't you believe it? It's in the Bible. And they say to me, and I say, I really do believe that. I really, really do believe that. So what are you saying? Well, just keep reading the rest of the verse. That's what I nearly always say. Keep reading. That is my usual response to people when they point out to a verse that says, and say, what about this? I say, keep reading. Just keep reading. Because you know what the rest of the verse says? The reason I call you to deny yourself to take up your cross and follow me, it is because he who seeks to save his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. So what is reasoning there? What is he arguing? How is he arguing? He's arguing is if you want great joy, deny yourself so that you can have great joy. But the big idea I want to draw your attention to is you get to that idea. You can demonstrate almost any heresy by picking out a few verses and saying, the Bible says this, And the Bible does say that, but it's not all it says. We need to look at that verse in context, the immediate context, the kind of midterm context, and in context of the overall gospel message, what does this passage teach? You take a passage like Philippians 2, 12 and 13, continue to work out your salvation. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, what does that verse mean? Well, the context would draw a a considerable light on this. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Well, that changes everything. Uh, Here's another one, James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You're to have a party when trouble comes your way. What does that verse mean? Well, first look at the immediate context. And in the immediate context, we read, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let's perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If you have a trial, it's going to make you strong. It's like a weight that you push against. And pushing against that weight is going to make you strong. And the only way to get strong is to push against that weight. And you need some trials in your life to push against so that you can develop perseverance. Perseverance, And when you develop perseverance, you become like the, a Paul who says, you know, if I die, that'd be good. If I don't die, that'd be good. Whatever happens, my daddy used to say about that verse, you can't, you can't put a man like that down. Uh, whatever happened to him, he's going to say, this is, this, this is a good deal. But look at that, con- that, that verse, not only in the short-term context, the immediate context, look at it in terms of the midterm context. In James 5.13, same verse, same person, say, is, uh, same author writes, is any one among you? you in tr- trouble? Well, let him throw a party. Is that what it says? No. He says, if anyone among you is in trouble, let them pray. You know, one of my favorite verses is, is in Ecclesiastes where it says, it is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. And there comes a time in life when trouble comes your way, you need to cry out to God. You need to cry out to God and pray. And there comes a time we need to learn to rejoice in, in, in all kinds of, of trouble. Uh, one more, be very careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by then. If you do this, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So question, should we do our works of righteousness publicly in order to be seen by others? Should we do our works of righteousness in such a way that others will see us? Should we be intentionally public about our works of righteousness? Well, if this is the only verse we'd have, we'd say, absolutely not. Jesus said, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. But let's look at the context. Not in this case, the short-term context, but the midterm context. In this same sermon, Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works works. Well, what is he saying here? Well, however you interpret that last verse, you have to interpret in light of this verse, in light of the overall context. And so teacher, when you study
study the Bible in order to teach the Bible, you want to ask yourself the question, what else does the Bible say? What does the immediate context say? What does the midterm context say? That is, generally speaking, the book as a whole. And then in light of the overall gospel message, what is this passage teaching us? And you'll get out of many errors uh, by if, if you'll follow the advice of John Piper, who simply said, keep reading.